the Hestalen Lights, observed in Norway's Hestalen Valley, presents an enduring mystery that tantalizes UFO enthusiasts. These unexplained lights vary in color and intensity, having been witnessed consistently since the 1980s. They often appear at night, floating or darting through the sky with no discernible source or explanation. While skeptics attribute these phenomena to natural causes like ionized iron, dust, plasma, or gases, many UFO proponents see them as potential evidence of extraterrestrial visitation. This belief is reinforced by the light's seemingly intelligent maneuvers and lack of conclusive scientific explanation, making the Hestalen lights a compelling case for ongoing UFO research and speculation. I'm on a journey of discovery. I'm seeking answers to some of the most challenging mysteries that face mankind, and many nuggets of knowledge that could bring those answers are unsolved cases and tales of the strange and unexplained. These shows focus on recounting cases and stories of unknown phenomena, mysterious events, weird places, and the unexpected. So please make sure to like, subscribe, and comment your thoughts on the case we're about to cover today. Today's episode of Tales of the Strange and Unexplained is particularly special as we are joined by members of the Project Hestalen team. These dedicated researchers have spent decades investigating these enigmatic lights in Norway's Hestalen Valley. So I'm going to bring them right in. We have so much to talk about and I am incredibly excited. Thank you guys for being here. How are all of you? Fine. I'm fine. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Before we get into the meat and potatoes of this, I first wanted to just kind of for people to know who you are and just a brief background. And Fred, we'll start with you. Tell us what you do for Project Hestalen. Well, now I am the um, daily manager, the CEO of Project Hestalen. Uh, so I'm just trying to pull all the strings. Um, and we basically restarted it uh, this spring and summer. Uh, now we are 25 people, and that are the people that I'm trying to get to do the work. <laughs> there you go. And Alan, what about yourself? Well, I is uh, one of the founders of Project Test Sound back in 1983. And at the moment, I'm the chair of the steering board of the new Project Test Town. So, so you're you're one of the founding fathers here. You're you're the original. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that's right. I've been doing this for 40 years. My goodness. And Magnus, what about yourself? Uh, I'm the technical director of the project. So I'm and Alan is of course my mentor. Uh, him being the, the pioneer, founding father. Uh, I'm I'm also board member of the of the organization. Mm -hmm. Board member of, I missed it, I apologize. Uh, I'm a board mem member of what it has done as well. All of us are, me, Fred, mm -hmm. and Alan. That's exciting. So all of you are the wheels of the operation, the brains of the operation as well, and, and you make it go forward because yeah, there's a lot of work oh, that gets into the, that goes into the project, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yes. This, this was a project. But now it has actually become like an registered as a nonprofit organization. That's what happened this summer. So that's brand new information. Yeah. So before it was a project, but now it is a nonprofit organization that you guys registered over the summer. Yes. That's yes. so exciting. But even though it has now just become an organization, people have been seeing very strange lights in Hestalen since the 80s. That's when it gained its popularity. But people have been seeing them way before that. And a little fun fact for those listening in, Hestalen right now has a population of about 150 people. So that's like an itty bitty. That's a family. That's the size of my family. All right. It's very tiny. <laughs> but um uh, Alan, we'll start off with you. What when was one of the very first cases recorded, and what are these lights in particular? Well, uh, the huge amount of sightings started uh, late 1981, uh, but we have found some few uh, descriptions of sightings before that as well. Uh, when we come to Heston the first time back in 1980s. 
uh, we found out that uh, we talked with old people and uh, they told us about um, their sightings when they were young and so on. But we don't have so very many of those uh, in the old times. Uh, but when we started collecting the data, when it started to have this big flap, we call it a we call it the UFO flap when it started in December 1981, and at the most uh, when we was recording that, uh, talking with people, it was up to 20 uh, descriptions of different people uh, a week, and that's quite a lot uh, if you come think of this small Norwegian valley it's only about i think 15 kilometers long so that's, that's much that's tiny and uh, fred here's an interesting question that peace of mind has and that is are there any nuclear plants near hastalen i don't think there's any in norway no <laughs> the more you know see i didn't know that piece of information <laughs> But um, looking looking at this from the beginning, in these when people are seeing these lights, are they also seeing any definite shaped craft, or is it just weird streaks in the sky that are happening consistently, especially between 1981 and 1983? Um, yeah. You want me to make a comment on that? Uh, we it's have we have. Uh back in the early 80s when there were so many of those we have both uh, crafts description uh, and uh, the lights uh, showing up so we have both uh, in fact oh magnus do you know what kinds of shapes people were seeing by chance yeah i mean i've heard everything from classical uh, disc-shaped things to cylindrical, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, I think those are the most common I heard about, and also, but also, actually, I heard lights turning into crafts, um, mm -hmm. there are a few of these stories as well, I mean, I, well, you only see the lights first, and then there was a craft, what? yeah, so, so there's, there's a good mix of things, um, I think both both small and, and, and large ones actually um but also kind of in between i mean like there was a metallic cloud it was described by big as a barn it was described by a, a couple of scientists and students that were there and uh, which turned into lights and, and stuff like that so it's it's a mix of it all i, I would say can you explain a little bit more uh, what you mean by a metallic cloud? Can you give us a description on what that might look like? Yeah, my dear, I mean, I, mean, I, I wasn't there, but um, of course. I think it, it was a description of, I mean, it looked like it was reflecting like a metal surface, I guess, mm -hmm. but cloud you know, kind of implying that it was not 100% rigid or solid, maybe. Uh, but maybe Oli has more information about that. Yeah, I can tell you uh, about uh, some uh, descriptions uh, made by two different... They said it was a metallic uh, uh, shape, metallic uh, surface on it. It was more a cigar-shaped type, uh, and uh, uh, both of them described as just uh, outside this uh, metal uh, uh, surface, it was like something glowing. If you, if you can imagine some, some, some not fire, but some glowing thing, some lights uh, surrounding this uh, object when it was moving. Uh, the first uh, of these. Uh, um, there are two of those which we know very good because we have talked with the, with the people uh, precisely. And on one of them, it was very interesting because it turned into 
something solid out from nothing. If you can ima imagine you're sitting, looking out in the air, in the nature, resting, and then when you are looking out in the air, not so far away from you, something start to um, be, be seen. It can be slowly become clearer and clearer, and then there it is. Mm -hmm. The other one, uh, which I also uh, mm, which also made a very strong impression was uh, a lady who was not so far from the river. Uh, she wasn't uh, aware of there was a bright light down by the river. And she thought that was strange because uh, what is uh, making lights down in the river? down towards the river. She couldn't look, see the river uh, when, when uh, because it was too low. The, the river is too deep though. But uh, after some, some short time, uh, this uh, strange light started to move upwards and then she saw the whole thing. It was an object. She described it as the same thing as um, the previous one, metallic uh, with some glowing around it uh, and it moves in the beginning slowly up from the river and then it uh, started to move away very fast. And that's that, the two. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. We have a question yeah. here by AJ Raffles and he asks, uh, can the difference be explained, please, between a Hestal and light and a ghost rocket? Does anyone know the answer to that? Yeah, Thanks, I, can, I, I can uh, take that one. So I would say that the ghost rocket is more of a, a niche, uh, I would say, within the UAP uh, history because it's, it's a special type of observation and it's actually mostly from 1946 and 1947 when people saw this um, well i would say it's a mix of sight but it's typical something elongated flying and then uniquely that's what's unique with the ghost rock is that they all land in the lake and it's all in august july or august it's all in the summer and all and and, and big uh, investigations has been undergoing like the one we have done uh, this year and one of the cases here uh, close to Hestalen. Um So that's kind of what's what's a ghost rocket is. I mean, the actual what it could be considered a UIP and an unknown craft that lands, but it, but then it disappears. That's the, that's the big uh, kind of strangeness factor in that. Um, uh, so so that's kind of what what a ghost rocket is a specific a series of observations that have a lot of very odd things in common, like landing in a lake and sinking. And this is happening in Hestalen. Well, I have the pictures now if you want to show it. Yes, absolutely. Why, there it so is. That, that's a dive we did uh, this uh, actually October uh, before the ice laid on the lake. The lake is not far from Hestalen. Um, and, and there's just, it's one of the lakes there. And this is a 1947 uh, observation. Uh, where one, uh, well, actually four witnesses saw a uh, craft coming in. And one of the unique things with the ghost rocket is also that it seemed to have a control. I mean, they're not just linearly, you know, uh, flying and then just, you know, crashing into the water. They're typical, and most of the observation talk about turns, controlled turns at very low altitude and slowdowns, and like just splashing in a controlled way. And then see, most of them sink, building uh, of is sinking down. Um, so it, it's 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 very very strange and very hard to connect it to rocket technology and things like that uh, of that time. And it has been going on. There are a few of those even to modern days. How many reports do you think you've collected in 2023 alone, Fred? Could you answer that one? No, but uh, Alan can because he's the one that uh, putting out these uh, reports and put again on the website. Well, all it's actually on the website. Yes, 
now there is uh, from 1998 to 2022, uh, people have reported 166 uh, reports uh, and they are all uh, on the website. Uh, so it's possible to read the reports which people telling when they see it. And that's, that's uh, people have seen it from with their own eyes though. Some of them have uh, uh, illustrations, some have pictures and so on. So I uh, could uh, ask people to go in and look at the reports. And that website is hestalen.org. That link, along with a few others, will be in the description box below once this live show is over. I do highly recommend that you look at their website because then they go into really fantastic detail. And thank you, Fred, for sharing that. They go into date, great detail on cases. It's it's cataloged. It's organized. There's pictures. There's videos as well, including on their YouTube channel. They do have videos of weird things being caught in the sky because you have... you you use special technology to go ahead and not only wh where you collect data of what's happening at the Hestalen Valley. And that's one thing about the Hestalen project that might differ from an average UFO enthusiast, where you guys are really doing boots on the ground investigations, but also collecting data and more importantly, making that data public, which people scream about all the time. And you are doing exactly that. So I want to get into that aspect. And Fred, thank you for sharing this. Be uh, Tell us about the blue box that was installed in 1998 well first of all it's uh, uh, as you can see there are um, um, many cameras and equipment on it uh, Erling has uh, been the one that has set it up um, there's one camera that is an alarm camera that it will take pictures during the night and in the morning it will send these pictures to a folder on the website on the old hestalen.org. And then, uh, unfortunately, Erling has to go through manually each one of these. Okay. So I can actually show you a little bit here, because if you see here, now these are some of the pictures, uh, lights. You see there's an orange light here. There's something here, something here, something here. So these are some of the pictures I took from this one. Um, and, and on the site, you will also find out that... Uh, and maybe I can show you the site once again a little bit here, because on the site here, you have um, all these uh, years. So you can just click on any year and you'll see um, the pictures and the video. So you can go through it uh, step by step. Um, but some of them, it's like there is a picture, but actually you have to go through the video and it's something interesting in one frame or two frames and that's it. Um, there's another comment here. You see, this is where the files are, old Hestal.org files. And you just get all the files and you have to go through each one of these folders for each day and kind of sort out uh, and find out what is valuable or not. So that's a lot of work for Erling still. Oh. Yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe I should uh, comment that uh, uh, all the alarms uh, captured the last night from the automatic uh, alarm system in the blue box is transferred to the website and everyone can have a look at them uh, mm -hmm. if they want they come in every morning but most of them are false alarms so those which i consider to be interesting are put on the folder if you go to the website i call it pictures and 2023, for instance, and pictures 2022, uh, that's uh, what I consider could be interesting. So that's the system, the alarms coming from the uh, automatic camera system in the blue box that is, is now. Uh, uh, go back to the observation, uh, which uh, the report I told you about, uh, they can also be found uh, if you look at uh, what I call the <clears throat> um, observations this year. 
an observation previous years. So uh, all the observations done in one year, all the different reports, if you click on, for instance, descriptions or um, observation this year, uh, then you get all the reports from this year, 2023. <laughs> and uh, similar yeah you are on this one observations this year yeah so this is what people have seen not what yeah. the camera takes automatically but this is what people are sending information to erling or to our uh, email address and then we yeah. get these uh, reports and then yes. you can just go back and see what they've sent in and pe so, people are asking uh, questions regarding the technology. And first of all, Sapphire, thank you so much. Cassidy, we're going to get to your question in just a moment. But uh, for example, Cyber is asking, is it light sensitive? And then to couple that, Chris is saying, what UFO program do you use to detect these craft? Uh, what, what technology are you guys using currently? Uh, in the blue box, the, the mm. alarm system with the camera attached to it. Uh, it's a software from uh, made by Italian scientists. We call it the SUSU -SU <laughs> software. I'm not, uh, I don't know if many are familiar with that. It's a quite simple system. It reacts if uh, some sudden lights or some sudden thing happen in a picture, which wasn't there. Uh, just the moment before. So it, in that way, it captured every planes, every, uh, every known things as well, because the plane does also have a light. Uh, so those are taken away, uh, of course, but uh, you have some few of those uh, uh, alarms, which I consider could to be interesting, which could be this phenomena. So mm. this is coming from the automatic system, which we now we want to improve, of course, uh, so we get a better quality on the pictures and better everything. Uh, but the other thing was the report from people telling in. So we, in fact, we have two different uh, alarm systems, one coming from people telling uh, about their observations and one coming from the automatic camera system. Uh, so I what I'm showing now is that uh, we are getting two cameras, two high resolution cameras from the uh, University of uh, Würzburg. So we are very hopeful for that because they have an AI uh, trained system um so we're just waiting for them to come and show us that and then i wanted to sh let a a magnus comment on uh on the blue box a little bit that's him on the top there yeah so I, i'm uh, so first of all i think we have to kind of acknowledge that the blue box has done a fantastic job uh, for about 25 years uh it's a bit outdated technology as having already mentioned so the plan is to upgrade this and there is a few, well, you can't go and buy this off the shelf easily, but then we have like the U for that and the Sky360 and then uh, systems that are kind of, well, there is there is a, at least a partial match with, with what we want to do, um, but, but more or less nothing comes out of the shelf, uh, off the shelf uh, to buy, of course, uh, uh, a tracking system for UAPs. Um, especially the way we want to do it, because we don't only want to do cameras, we want to have other types of sensors as well. And we want to have an integrated, I would say, anomaly detection system uh, going forward. Uh, but right now we focus on upgrading the cameras and the software. I mean, of course, getting modern uh, AI uh, to process uh, that and, 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 and kind of do the job that Alan does manually today. But that's kind of the first one. But then, of course, um, going forward, uh, for example, thermal cameras has been very little used or not used at all in Haskell, which is a shame, I think. But that's how it is, and we want to change that as well. Fred, and, and I know, go ahead. Please. I just want to add one important thing, that because these things have been seen on radar. Um, 
which is that may sound strange for a light, but the radar will uh, play some role in this as well going forward. Um, yeah. Fred, a little bit earlier, you mentioned that you are all partnering with a university in Norway to kind of get better equipment and using their AI programs. Can you go into more detail on that, on how the university there uh, agreed to work with uh, the project Hestalen? Well, this is a university in uh, Germany. Oh. And this is a contact that uh, uh, Erling has because he has contacts with every organization that is interested in UAPs all over the world. So uh, Hakan Kayan is, uh, is a professor uh, and um, he is the one that is has some students working on this project. So and we have we have uh, meetings and uh, uh, just last week uh, um, the student was uh, online and he, he showed us the status and demonstrated. So that's why we are so eager to get it up in the in the valley and uh, get proper. Uh, it's not going to do triangulation still. It's going to have two cameras and i think the reason they want is because if there's like a bug in front of one camera it's not going to be a bug in front of the other camera so then the software will be able to find out that so it's more for the filtering out um, in that process aling when do you think that will be finalized well uh, we hope as soon as possible of course uh, as it is now, uh, the cameras, which is working though, it gives alarms, gives interesting, but they're old, they're outdated, absolutely. Uh, the, but the new the, one? But the new one, uh, well, they said, um, they, well, they're testing it out in, at the university now. It's new cameras, it's um, new everything, uh, and they're testing it now and i think they have said they want to put it up um, this year but yeah. <laughs> it's maybe some practical uh, uh, solution for instance snow climbing up in the tower when it's icy and some practical things so i don't know but maybe next year Hopefully, because I mean, right now in the in the dead of winter in Norway, it's intense. You guys get a lot of snow. I mean, I think putting up anything would be very difficult. But, you know, if you have that dedication, you can do whatever your heart desires. Right? It seems that is the case. Cassidy has a question here going a little bit earlier, talking about waters and the ocean. And Cassidy, thank you for that. It says, has Dalin is close to the ocean. Could they, referring to the UFOs, be coming from the ocean? Any thoughts on that? Well, it's, uh, I would say it's far away from the ocean. Uh, Trondheim is uh, at the ocean as 120 uh, kilometers. So I think I would say that is far away. Although, but there are lakes in the, in the, in the um, valley, big lakes. So instead of ocean, you can uh, talk about lakes. And that's an interesting picture, uh, question. Uh, we have very few uh, stories of people, uh, including the lakes in the description, but some few. Uh, so um, uh, we are collecting data. So we'll see what it turns out to be, if there is any connections with lakes. We don't know yet. Ooh. Magnus, my next question is for you. And that is, which theories about the origin of the lights are you all currently exploring or find the most plausible? Well, um, <laughs> that's a really good question because, um, I mean, there are there are hypotheses, I would say, not really theories, <laughs> but hypotheses about this, what's behind this. And, and there are good ones, everything from from just dust and some charge from 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 geophysical to wormholes, um, but none of it has actually been able to, you know, even on paper, uh, describe all the characteristics. 
uh, I mean, we have to remember we have different types of lights. We have formations, and, and that would need to count in the crafts. Then, then, uh, I mean, it, it's really complex. And, and um, yeah, so I would... Um, uh, I, I don't know if we have, I mean, we try to be, stay, you know, objective and, and try to, we, we want, what we want is to collect more data so that we can kind of exclude some theories and actually work on, so have, you know, start building a working hypothesis. Um, that's the point with this project, and not to uh, try to be unbiased as far as we can, as a scientist should, should be. Um, and, and, and I, I think uh, we need, uh, I mean, there, we already have some data, but we need much more data. Uh, I would like to have a comment on the, when we are searching for an explanation. Uh, one of the problems is that the different descriptions of the behavior of all the sightings up there, uh, we have split them in three or four different groups and one is uh, short flashes lasting for from um, less than a second up to maximum a couple of seconds mostly it's uh, much less than one second so it can be very hard to see they are normally blue or white um, and last very short time that's one type the second type is a ball of light, uh, uh, which can be, uh, well, we have some three meters in diameter, all different sizes, 10 meters in diameters, uh, which can last for minutes, even hours. And they can move fast and move uh, slowly. And they can be so strong in illumination that it, uh, the ground beneath it is illuminated. Uh, and the shape of them is quite different. It's not oval shape, it's around, it's all, all kind of different shapes. Well, that was type two. And type three uh, consists of some, some lights connected to, which are connected to what the people describe as a black, black object. When they see several lights, uh, are connected in a way. When it moves around in the valley, they're all connected. It seems to be on something. Um, and so it's uh, some, we can call it an object. Well, some uh, people have talked about the object when they have seen this, when it's not completely dark outside, but they all consist of several lights. We have also similar with the uh, uh, combination with uh, with um, uh, the yellow light, uh, where people have described that the yellow light also consists of several other lights. Well, that's the third one, and the fourth one is the object, though standard objects. Uh, those who are most easily to see is type one, the flashes. Uh, as soon as we become aware of those, because we didn't, was we we wasn't aware of those in the beginning, because we didn't see them. Uh, it happened that we we got them on on cameras the first time, and then we thought, well, maybe there are some uh, short flashes here. And after we become aware of those, uh, we saw them more easily. Um, and, uh, well, back to the uh, point where we're talking about the solution, when we have four so different descriptions of the phenomena, it's hard to believe it's the same thing, it's the same cause. So that's uh, sometimes we talk about uh, maybe there are can be several different solutions, we don't know. If you're enjoying the show thus far, hit that like button. It lets me know that you're enjoying the show and it tells YouTube, hey, we want more content like this. And if you are enjoying the panel, hit that like button as well. So here's my question for anyone that wants to answer this, because you mentioned, Aling, you mentioned lights and different colors. Do these different color lights demonstrate different characteristics from another 
color light or are they kind of sharing the same types of maneuvers or is it random altogether? Uh, I would say that the, the maneuvers of the lights are so, so much different. You have the whole variety of different descriptions of the maneuvers. Uh, so it's uh, difficult to find some characteristics of uh, all this. Uh, and I think that uh, much mm, the, one of the big problems in finding one solution is the variety of uh, the, the phenomena. Uh, all the way from uh, solid objects, which are not so often though, uh, to the big lights uh, moving around, the, f the flashes. So it's hard to believe that all these are the same thing. So that's the challenge. I want to add one thing. You know, when I joined the project, I call them the energy objects because one thing we know from a purely physics point of view is that there is uh, energy involved. We know that. Everything that you know, it's light has some kind of internal energy source, and if they move, probably have some kind of energy source for that as well. And the same one, so we, we know there is energy involved, but but and this is one of the key problems with more or less all the theories is that or hypothesis is that where is the energy coming from? Um, that that's a true mystery, and uh, I think that. Uh, I'm agree with uh, Aling that there are so many var 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 varieties of this that it's hard to you know make a model that actually explains it all, and that's why it's so intriguing. I think to be involved in this. Well, since this since since this has gained popularity since the 80s, there have been some theories that due to the Hestolan area, the mountains and the valley area is filled with minerals that could potentially create these lights. What are your thoughts on that theory? Can I, I can shoot on that. I mean, there are these earth lights, um, uh, supposedly global phenomenon. And, and if you look at Hestolan specifically, there is, I mean, there is a special geology. Well, some places of Norway have a relatively uh, you know, unique uh, geology and, and, and uh, types of rocks. And uh, we have this quartzite uh, rich um, fila, fillet uh, uh, and uh, greenstone, which is metal rich. And um, there are, of course, one of the theories is that the, the quartz, known for you know, these electric effects. Could produce high voltages that could ignite something that's in the air and then we have the mines so we can all agree that Heston has a uh, relatively unique uh, kind of geology but it's not completely unique from a Norwegian perspective either um, so that, that's it's, yeah it's, an, uh, it's, it's a very hard to kind of you know say definitely that it's caused by geology. From your observations and the reports that you have collected since as far back as you could, Cassidy asks, do they appear to be intelligently controlled? Uh, we have as some few which could uh, um, raise that question. Of course, uh, it's very difficult to uh, prove anything like this, but uh, um, we have uh, some happenings uh, which uh, I will say could indicate there must be something more in in the background. Could it be some kind of? We have some uh, few. I must say few. Uh, some kind of interaction. Uh, it uh, changed behavior when we pointed the light to, to, in, to it, uh, for instance. Uh, and uh, also um, when we pointed <laughs> a red uh, laser to it, it uh, answered with a um, red point laser back. <laughs> so we have s some few of those. But Can you go uh, into more uh, detail on that, please? That's, that's fascinating. Yeah, well, yeah, it's uh, standing, uh, the story is in my uh, 
technical report, which can be found in the Hestown, old Heston website. Uh, if you go to report from 1984, that was the first uh, field work we had up there. In uh, when this uh, happened, uh, it was uh, a, f a flashing light uh, when we uh, pointed a red weak uh, red laser towards it. It uh, changed the flashing frequency, it doubled flashing frequency. And we took the laser, we was very surprised, so we took the laser down again. It was not a strong laser. And then it returned back to normal flashing. And we took it up again, and it doubled uh, again. And uh, that test was done uh, nine times, and in eight of those nine times, it uh, doubled the dub fre flashing frequency. What the strange thing is that we use a red laser, and one week after this testing, while still during the, the field work, uh, we, uh, the observers which was standing out um, on, on, on the snowy ground, uh, suddenly saw a red light uh, moving around their feet for just some few seconds, uh, and they disappeared. Uh, if there is any possibilities, uh, well, it's very easy to take any, <laughs> any thinking, uh, we can say, uh, that, uh, well, <laughs> red, red light towards them and red light to, back to us. Um, mm -hmm. We have also some other uh, description, although I must say very few. So when we are searching for <laughs> as explanation, I think it's wrong to take those very few stories uh, to bring in to find the explanation. Although these uh, stories make it extremely uh, exciting. Yes. I mean, just listening to it, I'm, I'm very excited to have to be able to hear you collect data with attempting to communicate with these lights uh, using lasers. You mentioned red, but are there any other colored lasers that you've attempted to use for communication and has it caused or created any different characteristics? Uh, we we uh, haven't, uh, or me, <laughs> haven't done any more uh, testing. Uh, and uh, on on that, uh, <laughs> but uh, of course that could be interesting. Although I must uh, point out, when we are using a laser, we always use a weak laser, not mm. strong. So uh, people should be, uh, if they want to do any test or such kind of things, you you have to use uh, not uh, very strong. Uh, we, uh, um, I think the laser we used uh, was only one milliwatt. That's uh, that's wow. extremely little, but that was enough to get the response. That's exciting, but it also goes to show that you need to be mindful when dealing with lasers because they can be harmful. They can also be dangerous, and you don't want to shoot a laser at a helicopter mm -hmm. or an airplane because then you're going to be fined no. and maybe go to prison. We don't want that. Not today, no. not any day. LiDAR Anomalies asks a interesting question about the imprint or cutouts in the marsh. Do you know what they're referring to? And can you go into more detail on that? Yeah. Yes, uh, we. Uh, it was uh, found uh, not so far from Hestown, uh, to the west in the, in the wilderness, um, a piece from the ground. It was some soil which was uh, uh, cut out and uh, uh, put, uh, and this piece of wet soil was big, so it's uh, if people should have done that, uh, it would have been destroyed. A <laughs> yeah, big piece of wet soil, several meters, uh, was uh, it looked like it was lifted up and placed on the ground, very few uh, meters away from it. Um, no one did see this happen. 
it was uh, seen by some hunters which was uh, hunting uh, in that uh, area uh, and we don't know when it was uh, uh, done um, um, but uh, we, but it was very strange the whole thing we don't know what it was uh, i've heard that uh, similar uh, happenings have happened other places too uh, both in norway and also in the states uh, and i haven't seen any explanation which i can explain those Ooh. Fred, I do want to say, first of all, thank you for just being so proactive and sharing your screen and, and really following along with everyone saying because it makes it that much more interactive. But now I have a question for you, and that is what role does public interest and engagement play in your research on the Hastal and Lights? Well, the, the problem for now has been that uh, uh, we don't have, uh, I want to show the last one for me here. The problem has been that we don't get any funding. So if we go to the government, if we go to academic and try to get money, it's very difficult. Of course, we've only had no, no, and no, and no. So we never know if we try again. But that's basically why we are trying to turn to the public and see if we can get some um, some members or some donations. So, And that's vital and, uh, for any research. It's just getting that funding, which is, is never easy. Yeah, yeah, it is. So my job is to kind of get people to subscribe to our, um, uh, we have a Discord, we have the um, YouTube. Uh, we don't have much on the YouTube because we we are not YouTube like you, uh, but we do want to have members. Uh, and what we try to do is that we, uh, if you pay five dollars, five euro a month, something like that, then we try to open an area on Discord. Let me see if we can open Discord uh, so I can show you. Um, because we have a members area. And I kind of find it interesting that, let me see, I can open like this. And while you do that, as I mentioned earlier, yeah. all their links are in the description box below. And here's the biggest thing that's different from Project Hastal into any other group is that they are making their information public. And that's what we all want to see. But it does require some funding to get the equipment out there and to make sure that it's all running smoothly. So if you like to be up to date what's happening there in Hestal in Norway, consider being a member. It's just five euros a month, which is like what, like six, six dollars a month, okay, we're talking about like USD, right? It's going to be worth it because they are making their information public. They're not a private corporation. They're not the government. They're not hiding anything from you. And as they had mentioned, they're trying to look at this from a scientific standpoint, not bringing in bias, not saying it's aliens or that it's something totally <laughs> natural. They don't know what it is. And we can join that journey with them of trying to understand what exactly is going on there. So I am the one that is not a scientist. I'm basically just like project management and stuff like that, trying to get people interested in this. And uh, when when people are so careful about saying like uh, aliens, then I am the one that can say it. And and uh, let me let me show you uh, if I can move this down to the screen. Uh, why not? Uh, looks like I have to go out of this mode and go down. Whoops. <laughs> That's strange. Let me see. Okay. If we do like that, yes. So this is um, this is the member area, and we have uh, Mats that has been making illustrations. And for me, it's kind of interesting that when we are taking pictures, we have a few pictures of these solid objects uh, and but when people uh, are witnesses they are telling stories about crafts that are like like Jan Moen here saying that uh, he saw something he thought was an airplane in the beginning but no wings moving in, down the valley so we have a number of illustrations of what people have seen 
And I'm so happy that Magnus has been putting cameras all over the valley now, just in case we could actually get a proper uh, image like this. This is the illustration from 47, this um, uh, ghost rocket that they were looking for. That's very exciting. So, yeah, it's, yeah, because I am just, um, I, I just want to know, I want to know what the energy objects are, but if there are aliens, I definitely want to know. So everything is interesting. <laughs> regardless what the answer is you just want the answer and that's what it's about it's not bringing in that confirmation bias and amy here has a question that was also on my mind girl we're linked and it says i'm curious as to how the general population of norway feels about ufos <laughs> um well uh, maybe i should say a comment i don't have any good answer on specific that one but i can that question but i can say that in the beginning we changed we didn't use the word ufo uh, we used unknown light phenomena or we used the hestown phenomena which is a more cover and then uh, it all become much more easy to involve scientists and we got even schools uh, classes of students uh, from the uh, pupils coming up, uh, uh, working together with us and working together with uh, scientists from abroad as well, which has been there uh, many times. So, well, when you don't use the word UFO, uh, and um, it was much more easy. So I think that the Heston phenomena is uh, generally accepted in uh, in Norway now as a real phenomenon. Um, well, we, we <laughs> I don't know uh, if we use the word UFO. I don't know. Uh, Fred, I, I think. Oh, for, go ahead. For me, please. it's kind of like because I I um, I have noticed that the people in the valley they say that well we always use the word UFO and in the beginning it was. Uh, okay, because people were interested, and then it, they started to be ridiculed and laughed at, so they stopped. But now it's like, what can we use? We've used that word for 40 years. So that's what we want to know. What are these UFOs? And that's why I am, as a non-scientist, I feel that to kind of take them seriously, that's what they know. So they want to know what are these UFOs. And Magnus, uh, what are your insights on that? On what they are, <laughs> what people believe on the, in that, what people believe they are. Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, just referring to what does Norway, the country of Norway, think of UFOs? What's their viewpoint? I think it's mixed. I would say. I mean, there mm -hmm. are definitely those that you know are open to to something unknown really unexplained, truly unexplained uh, by science and everything. And um, there are, I think it's kind of like the rest of the world. I wouldn't say that Norway, not in my view, that Norway is very different from, from most other countries. It's quite similar. I would say that it's a split, um, for sure. And Fred, mm -hmm. you are now sharing your screen on LIDAR anomalies, and she's in the chat. Hi there. Can you share us some of her amazing work that she's doing regarding the Hestalen project? She is using uh, public data, public uh, uh, LIDAR data, radar LIDAR data. And she has uh, this YouTube channel where she's explaining how she finds some anomalies, not knowing what it is, but there are some orbs, a lot of orbs and a lot of triangular shapes that she finds around on the maps. So she's actually inviting to let's do some work together. Let's go through these maps and find out where are they? Uh, can we find out what it is? But that's, that's her uh, um, YouTube channel explaining how you can use these tools and public data to look at it. So she's a member of Project Heston. So there is 
interesting work. Oh my gosh, that is that is so exciting. And it goes to show that you can use public information to get the answers that you're looking for. But one question that I've seen in a live chat uh, a handful of times is referring to in the area of the Hestalen Valley, have there been any reports of cattle mutilations or crop circles or uh, anything of that nature to your knowledge? Uh, no. But, mm -hmm. but I would like to just make a little comparison with this piece of wetland that was lifted up. I mean, could be natural for sure, but it was very, I would say, surgically cut, um, straight angles. Uh, the roots mm -hmm. were like, like this. Um, that's a little bit similar, I would say, to the cattle manipulation phenomenon or um, I, I mean, I, it's just speculation if it's connected, um, but, uh, and there is a lot of, there are um, different, you know, there is a lot of farming in, in Hastalen, and we have a, <laughs> for the member who has uh, even llamas and, and uh, donkeys and <laughs> animals you normally don't find in Norway, and, but we have never seen, uh, as far as I know, anything like cattle mutilations, um, but, Humanoids uh, has been reported. Oh, uh, don't leave me hanging on that, Magnus. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, that's really. I mean, there's not a lot of those stories, um, but but there are a few of them, and um, I would say they are quite uh, amazing. Um, you know, humanoids walking in the woods uh, in the valley. And in some, in one case, at least, scaring some animals and uh, actually running away from the server. And uh, there is also an, an older story that I heard of uh, where, where a, a woman saw uh, something in Minecraft landing on the mountainside and, and took the binoculars and saw some kind of strange creature jumping around. And they actually went up there uh, later and saw some landing, some prints. That's what I've heard. Maybe Alan can fill in here. As, <laughs> um, but uh, that, that kind of adds to the mystery, I mean, a lot, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, there, there are some few, I will say few, which I have been heard of, uh, of these uh, kind of uh, creatures. But, uh, there are so few, so it's very difficult to take those into account, I think. Of course. No, that, that makes sense. But just still that, that well, one case, right? It's just enough mm -hmm. to make someone's eyes bulge out of their face. Hmm. Yeah. I have we one have case on, on this, on this uh, channel, Patrick Heston, 23. Uh, I have one case in here, um, and he's talking about what he has seen. So once again, I made this one because I feel that the, the witness is kind of always dismissed. Like, yeah, now you can't believe whatever people are saying, but there are so many documentaries about. Uh, so on the playlist here, I have um, historical videos. So many of these are good old videos uh, and a lot of witnesses commenting. Um, oh, yeah. That's that's exciting. Well, I know I only have you guys for a few more minutes. So I just want to ask you, what can people expect from Project Hastalen in the future? And I guess a question is, and I, I want you to sell yourself here, uh, why should they be a member to Project Hastalen as well? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's I, not uh, an easy question, I, I, I know. I, yeah. Well, first of all, uh, look at look out for projects because if you want to actually do something and not just think about it, then join and and help us to make a UIP detection system, a good camera system. Help us train the AI detection system. Uh, help uh, Marianne to uh, find anomalies in these uh, lidar data and so on. This is doing and not just talking or discussing. This is actually doing the science. And, and of course, we do need to get out this uh, information. So we need help on the web page and whatever. So I have a developer program. I'm inspired 
by uh, Sky360 and they have like regular developer meetings and I have joined a couple of times. I know Magnus had talked to them and we're trying to see if we can use their software or system in a way that suits us more. So we want to work more with them. That's my promise to 360, Sky360. Um, but there's a lot. If you want to learn about new technology, this is also something because now that we're trying to make the new web page, I want to have a database with the uh, witness reports connected to the blue box data, connected everything like that. So what if you can have a map and say, where are the yellow lights? Where are the red lights? <laughs> what area, what time and all this stuff. So people could help out doing that. I would like to add. Um, yeah, I think of instruments, better cameras. We have so many uh, observations uh, with the system is making. If we have better cameras and also triangulation, uh, we will get uh, really good pictures and, uh, and, and that will bring us closer to the explanation, I think. Uh, uh, and there's a lot of uh, good things we can use the money for. I would like to add one big revolution that has happened in the world since 1998 is drones. The drones, to me, could be a key to solving this mystery because we would like to get really... I mean, the phenom phenomenon is in the air, so we should be in the air. And, and I think uh, I, I will, uh, you know, Put a lot of work in, into that, uh, and I have, you know, already started that to get autonomous drones with the right instruments that can track these things and actually go really, really, really close, so close that they can touch them, if possible. Mm -hmm. We don't know. I mean, uh, so that that's for me. That's the the thing. That's what I've been thinking for years about uh, to use the drone technology to 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 elevate this project to to, to the next level. And, and yeah. this, this project is not just Norwegians. I mean, we have uh, one that is very interested in drones in Ireland. We have people from Italy and Germany. So, so this is not just Norwegians. So you're welcome. If you, if you know anything about this kind of technology, join us. And, and as we see, you see, you see what I'm trying to sell now? <laughs> yes, a field trip weekend, September 2024. Who doesn't love a field trip? Yeah, then you well, will actually be able to have some lectures. So Alan will talk and our uh, uh, scientist from Italy, uh, Massimo, he will have a, a speech and uh, Susan. Uh, so we have some lectures, but of course, we're going to go out when it gets dark and sit out there and have cameras and equipment and discussions and something to keep us warm because it's going to be cold in oh yeah i mean that's a great excuse to go to norway because i was telling this I was telling us to fred i think it was yesterday or two days ago they have the best chocolate on the planet there is no country that compares to norwegian <laughs> chocolate those little heart-shaped little thin chocolates in that yellow box i don't know what they're called but those are like my favorite <laughs> of on the planet so if you're ever going to go to norway this is a great example go september 2024 guys thank you so much for being on the show with me again all of their links will be in the description box below once this live show is over is there anything else you want to say before we head out here it's going to be an exciting next year well, that, that's the best way to end the show well that is it for today <laughs> i will see you tomorrow be safe and remember keep your eyes on the skies